and welcome to Ahqam SOS, the show that discusses duties and practices by His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. And this season we'll be looking at not just Sayyid Sadiq, but a whole load of Maraja as well. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah, and joining me is Sheikh Ali Ma'ash. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, now we've been discussing uh, youth, and we were discussing you know, about the youth and um, their obligations towards Islam, and then we were talking about how to address their issues. Uh, let's continue our uh, discussion and let's you know focus on the youth and their creed um what does you know the maraja say in, in terms of the importance of their creed and to promote islam a'udhu billahi as-sami' al-'alim min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi at-tayyibin at-tahirin allahumma sallallahu well one of the most important uh fact concerning the youth in their very beginning and early stage of life is the creed and the aqidah. Yes. so important that without having a profound belief, creed and aqidah, uh, that youth might end up uh, in a location or a place or a society or a community in which he will be or she will be uh, morally or um, psychologically hurt and destroyed. At the end of the day, um, the, the one who has a strong and profound belief, especially in the Islam and in the Holy Quran and the prophets and Ahl Bayt السلام, is the one who can secure himself and herself in this dunya and the akhirah. Otherwise, we can see uh, how the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are trying their best to deviate specifically the Muslim nation and more specifically mm -hmm. uh, the youth Muslims in the world okay. to destroy their moral uh, values, to destroy their creed and aqidah, to destroy even um, their uh, links and um, the relation between themselves and their parents and their sisters yes. and brothers and so forth. To destroy and put a great gap between them and their other society. Yeah, and other I mean, it's, it's, it's seen the prominent how in today's day, and I've seen it myself with some youth, not all youth, some youth, you know, the way they speak to their parents, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get away with it, neither could you in your time, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's obvious that there is maybe, you know, times have changed or there may be a hidden agenda or something, but it's something that needs to be addressed. Sheikh Ma I know I, I came across one of these youth uh, and this person was discussing about his uh, sister wearing a necklace with a cross on it um, you know and then you know let's, let's take it to fiqh can an individual wear a piece of jewelry a ring or you know a, 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 you know, a cross I mean uh, is, is, it, is it allowed I know Sayyid Sistani has addressed something like this yes I mean with this regard Sayyid Sistani mentions in his fatwa that um, it is not allowed if it propagates and spreads that certain belief. And that, of course, when we see somebody is wearing a cross, then th this means that he is basically oh, is a Christian, yeah. related to this religion, Christianity, for example. So these are symbols in which lead to the one's notion and understanding that this person is inclining or believing in that uh, belief or religion, so we can't really use it. So I said Shirazi, also he mentions that it's haram, so there's no way you can uh, wear a cross and uh, um, just because it's nice, you know, just to show my friends, mm -hmm. I don't mean to uh, believe in it or to show as a beauty, it's just to wear it for, for fun, for example, no. That has a symbol and sign to a specific creed and religion away from Islam. Sounds interesting, interesting. Sheikhna, how do we educate our youth? Because obviously, the, you know, there is a, a, you know, a barrier in between that we discussed before with language. You know, how important is it and how do we actually tackle this issue of educating our youth? 
you see the education of the youth begins uh, way back and many years back when they are in their early uh, ages of like three, four. Mm -hmm. um, the one should educate them in that time, at least. Of course, we have narrations. Uh, interesting that when, for example, the child reaches the age of, let's say, three, you teach him La ilaha illallah, for example. If he, if he reaches the age, of, for example, three and a half, I don't think exactly, exactly the, uh, mm -hmm. the months and, and, and years, but three and a half, you, you tell him to, to say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, and so forth. So from that early age, childhood age, you teach him to say the shahadat, the shahada, the first and the second shahada, and of course the third shahada of, of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Uh, so we teach them in that so early age. By the time they get to the age of youth and puberty and bulugh, they have a profound uh, and strong foundation and principle to build on for the rest of their life. So it all begins from the early childhood age. You educate them. Uh, for example, you show them practically, not only by the word of mouth or verbally, you teach them that, you know, I'm praying now. You can, you know, stand next to me and pray. Although he, he's, or she's three years of age, but they understand. They can understand and comprehend that this is an act of something, related to something. And then, for example, you sit down and read Quran, let's say in the month of Ramadan. Also, they can watch and see. So these are all recorded in their uh, memory and minds, all these acts. And they built on it their future life. So if, if it was in a religious place, they would incline and um, lean to the religious places. But if it was in a non-religious places, let's say in the bars and nightclubs, Billah, then they would incline and lean to those places. Billah. So it all begins from the early ages of yeah, life. Yeah, I think it's really important because they also say, you know, children copy their elders. So if the child sees the elder reading Quran, praying Salah, the child would often imitate it, um, even if they don't know how to pray Salah properly or how to read Quran properly. They'll, op they'll open up a book and you know they maybe put a hat on their head or you know they'll they'll get out the the sajada and and, and stand on it and, and perform ruku and sujood. But you know it's it's it's, it's, it's quite um, flattering as well as <laughs> important with our youth that we start from an early age and inshallah take it from there and take them to balugh and then inshallah take them towards marriage. Which my next question is, uh, Sheikhna is that how do we facilitate marriage for our youth? I mean, today's day and age, it's very, very difficult uh, for you, know, you to get married at the, you know, the you wouldn't say prescribed, but the recommended age. And also, you know, th there's so many like, difficulties with demands from you know, the, the girls. Sometimes it's not the girls, sometimes it's the parents uh, that the, the demands are very high. How can we facilitate marriage for the youth today? Well, basically, in the old time and the years back, you know, centuries ago, they had no issue with the marriage. It was straightforward, simple. You know, um, there's a proposal for marriage. They come forward. That's it. They agree on the mahar. And that's it. Uh, those two couples, they go and build their own nest for, for the next future years. Now things complicated due to the current situations, financially, politically. It's affecting, you know, we've imported some of the cultures from the East and the West. Um, sadly, uh, these are all as a consequ consequence of not practicing and following the true teachings of Islam and the Sunnah of the Prophet and his pure family as a result. That's why we see today that, for example, the mahar, the dowry is so high that even some youth would even uh, um, forget about uh, marriage and yes. they leave it till they're 30, for example. Yeah, they're, they're very discouraged, unfortunately. I mean, what can we do to rectify this? The best thing is to go back to the teaching of Islam that we see how the Prophet uh, Sunnah was, for example, the, the, mm. the way of marriage and the Sunnah in marriage. For example, the Mahar was no more than 500 dirhams which if you calculate by today's uh, uh, financial, for example, uh, system and, and, and the money, and you, you find that it's only less than 500 pounds. Mm -hmm. Today, some families I've heard, they want, or they spent on the marriage over 50,000 pounds. Wow. Imagine. 
So mm -hmm. the best thing is to follow these teachings. We try to be humble, especially in easing the marriage for the youths, because otherwise they'll found different way and, and methods in order to be related to the other uh, opposite gender, mm -hmm. which of course many of them do haram now. Mm -hmm. So the best thing is to see how Ahl al-Bayt and the Holy Prophet organized these, these uh, marriages for themselves, for their uh, daughters and sons, and for the rest of the Muslims. So the, we would basically uh, see uh, less uh, anxiety and uh, misery with regard to the marriage issues. And of course, the youths age, especially between the 16 and, and 19 years of age, are the most crucial time in mm -hmm. which the need for the opposite gender rises. And our roles are all everywhere, as we can see. I mean, today's with the, um, uh, the, the vast majority of the media coverage and internet and so forth attracts, tries to attract both gender to each other. Yes. So the marriage is the best issue that we try to set committees, uh, organizations to um, bring those two together in a halal way. Uh, those committees, those organizations to try to speak to both parents, for example, to persuade them that you know the, these two young um, um, the boy and the girl, they need each other. So make it easier for them so they can get uh, married easily and live their life. Yeah, I guess it needs a bit of a, a culture change maybe that because the culture that we have today in marriage and also the way it's done, maybe there, there needs to be some form of change. And you know, you know there's those benefits of being married and also one thing is that it takes up a lot of your time. And if you're not married and you have a lot of free time, what can be done in regards to that? So if the youth today, I mean, they go to school, college, university, and then the weekends, alhamdulillah, most of them are free in the evenings. What can be done with the youth? How should they fill up their free time? In terms of the free time, um, the best thing to start with, I think the parents can start at home by uh, teaching their kids, their children, now by talking to them, bringing some books to, uh, to add it to the library of the, of the, of the, of the uh, home and encourage them to read because see the schools encourage the kids and the pupils to uh, read s school books, which are, you know, for example, uh, the bear and the rabbit, for example, the stories of the kids that they have. Um, we have to also add to the library, our own libraries, the stories of Ahl Bayt the 14 infallibles. You have them in Arabic and English in all languages almost. Um, you can buy them off the internet, for example, or yeah, get them you can from even abroad. download them now, PDF. So, scroll on interesting the with cartoonic um, mm. drawings. So, they can understand this uh, culture, this, um, the way in which Ahl Bayt lived. So, it's important that we start from home. And as well, we can take them to the Islamic centers. They learn from um, the majalis, for example. Um, there are sessions for the youth in some uh, majalis for the kids as well. So we try to accommodate and tr try to, to encourage them and create that, in, that environment in which the youth and, and the kids can enjoy and understand. So a bit of play and games and a bit of uh, teaching and so forth. So we try to balance these issues and encourage our kids and, and the youth as well um, to understand that this aqidah, this belief is the correct and the a true belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you stay away from this aqidah or belief, then uh, who knows what is the future coming afterwards. Sheikhna. How can we deal with the youth uh, and their problems that they face? I mean, sometimes they feel, you know, ostracized or they feel that they can't really, they don't have someone to go to, someone that they can, you know, trust or someone they can relate to in regards to what they're going through. So, I mean, how can we help with their problems that they're facing? With regard to the problems, basically, we have to try our best to solve them by ourselves. If I, as a parent, 
can solve it, then I sit down with them and try to solve it. Be it uh, a social problem, be it a financial problem, be it um, a personal problem, um, any kind of problems we try to solve ourselves. If not, then friends, relatives, family, uh, whoever can get involved and solve it. Because the most important thing that we try to avoid the problem is uh, getting bigger and bigger and uh, we don't open the door towards other organizations and uh, in which they have to go there, Let's, especially non-Muslim organizations, for example, to seek advice and help. So we don't uh, reach that level of letting them to go and uh, especially to the courts, for example, in which they have to face the consequences. No, we try to solve it, even if they are in a state of corruption, you know, drugs and so forth, we try to solve it. We try to uh, make them to stop using these uh, materials and stay away from these issues. So we try to put the efforts ourselves initially, and if not, the community leader, the Islamic Center, the mosque, the Husseini, and so forth, the, the, uh, um, the Mawlana or the Imam who is in charge, to try to solve these problems. Because we don't, we don't lose our kids and to be in, in the hands of others. That's very important because gradually they'll be educated in the hands of others in a different culture and a different creed and aqidah. And that's the, the, the fear and danger. Thank you very much, Sheikhna. And then thank you to all our viewers for joining us on this episode of Ahkam SOS. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask the Sheikh, you can email us on ihkamsos at imamhussein.tv. Inshallah, the address will be at the bottom there. You can email your questions. Inshallah, on the next show, we'll be able to uh, address them. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.